Oh, okay. Folks, I know that uh, not everybody has yet had their dessert, but please do enjoy it, and, uh, but quietly as we proceed. We have a limited amount of time with the chairman, and I don't want to cheat any of you uh, from having an opportunity to hear Admiral Mullen. Um, I was thinking back when I first had the privilege to meet Admiral Mike Mullen. It was back when I was in the, in the department, and he was the commander of uh, the George Washington Battle Group, and uh, I believe it was in Bahrain uh, in 97, I think, or 98, and uh, as is the custom in the in the department when at Thanksgiving senior officers get behind the chow line and serve food to the sailors and the troops and I had the privilege of being on the George Washington with Mike at that time and uh, saw him in his multiple dimensions as a, as a leader. Uh, obviously a, a leader that, you know, it's a pretty big deal, you know, to be the commander of a battle group. And he not only was doing that, but you could see the personal esteem that he had with the young sailors uh, that would come through the line and recognize him, not just with kind of detached awe, I mean, <laughs> but with genuine appreciation and admiration. And it was a sign of the leadership that, frankly, he's brought to the department in the many different roles that he's played. Um, most, and obviously right now, in this very crucial role as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, you know, the chairman, this is a very unique position. It's one of the few positions in law that has stipulated quite clearly the responsibilities and in, stated in, in a, a layman's term, he represents, you know, 1.6 million active duty men and women and 1.2 million reservists as the single person who talks to the president to help him decide what to do. He is the representative of the entire uniformed services to the president in guiding our policies. And it's a, truly an awesome responsibility. It's, uh, it's one of those responsibilities that you give to someone not just because, he's, uh, because of his intellect, but because of his character. And we've seen that consistently in who we've brought forth from among us to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Remarkable individual doing a superb job. Uh, Michael, thank you for joining us today. This was, people wanted to be here to hear you see this turnout. This is exceptional, but it reflects the crucial times we're in and the leadership you're giving. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen. Thank you, John. Truly, uh, one of the joys of being in this business is to meet and work with special people. And back to that time that John talks about uh, when I actually really did meet him in what I thought was my last tour in the Navy uh, and uh, recognized uh, he, uh, his spouse, and how special they were and literally how much they cared and have had great opportunity to work with John since, and John, thank you for all you've done and all you do, uh, with great expectations for the future, by the way, uh, as well. Um, Mr. Ambassador, in particular, I'd like to say thanks to you for hosting this and your, you and your country's uh, dedication to our partnership, and uh, as is the case with so many of the countries who are here. To Chairman Zinni, I just wanted to say hello. Uh, we're here, a lot of us are here, and and uh, still around because we had people that affected us when we were young, and Tony Zinni is one of those that uh, all of us coming up uh, look to as a model in so many ways uh, as an officer who, who had a you know, wide bandwidth, uh, great reach, uh, and, uh, and, and someone who could actually do so many things. So it's great to see you here, Tony, and congratulations, I think, on your, on your new assignment. Uh, this is about the Middle East, and I'll talk uh, for a few minutes and then open it certainly uh, up to questions. Um, as I walked in, uh, John said they almost had a heart attack because they saw me in Moscow yesterday. Uh, and actually, I can say that, that uh, there were many in Moscow on Sunday that said, isn't he supposed to be here when I was 
doing the television shows on Sunday morning here. So it's, it's actually part of uh, the job that is both challenging and rewarding, but it really is, uh, it, it is terrific to be with you for the time today. Um, I think the gathering alone speaks to the requirement uh, for cooperation uh, and also the priority for the Middle East, the broader Middle East, and the challenges that we have. And I won't certainly go over all of them. When I came in as chairman, one of the priorities for me, in fact, my top priority, was to work on strategic issues associated with the broader Middle East because I feel then and continue to feel now it's, it's the most volatile area. It's an area that, that has challenges which abound and that no one can address alone, not the United States, and that we must do this uh, across the full spectrum, not just of our government, which includes much more than the military, uh, includes all aspects of our national power as well as that of so many other countries uh, around the world. Um, in recent months, certainly, at, at that time we were heavily focused, obviously, on Iraq, and that has now shifted. The main effort is now uh, shifted to Afghanistan, uh, and the regional approach to include Afghanistan and Pakistan. And really the broader, uh, the broader strategic approach there is so critical. Uh, but the challenges which I spoke to then uh, are still there from Beirut to Tehran to uh, a stable gulf uh, with uh, trying to understand how this, how we, how we proceed into the future and how we engage and address uh, the countries that are involved in this is so, so critical. Um, and I'm also fond of saying that uh, I think as urgent as the situation is, and it is and continues to be, uh, there also needs to be both a long-term view and an element of patience that recognizes we're not going to solve these things overnight. It's going to take a while. It's going to take constant engagement, constant pressure, uh, a constantly a, a – con comprehensive approach uh, apro across all aspects of what we do. Um, I'll speak just briefly for, uh, for a second on, on Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, and, and as I think about that, clearly new leadership there, both on the, uh, on the political side, diplomatic side with Ambassador Eikenberry, and those that are working for him uh, in the embassy. Uh, new leadership with uh, General Stan McChrystal, who's been out there for a couple of weeks now uh, and is very obviously focused on understanding uh, the, the entire situation as he is commanding it. Uh, I think uh, in the last day or so uh, issued his a tactical directive that focuses very specifically on uh, minimizing, eliminating civilian casualties, and I think that speaks and what he said in his testimony. Uh, is critical and is a critical benchmark. It's not about how many enemy we kill. It's about how many civilians we protect. Uh, and that thrust says an awful lot about what we need to, what, what he's about and what we all need to be focusing on there. But we've lost, uh, as many of you know, uh, we lost seven soldiers yesterday. Um, uh, it is indicative of uh, expectations that I've had for some time that this fight is going to be tough. It's going to be tougher before uh, we uh, before it gets easier. We've added significant additional forces, and I think uh, there the the operation which the Marines kicked off last week is indicative of that. Very focused in the south, heavily focused in the south in Helmand, and so I think we are in for a tough fight. And I was asked the other day how long. Uh, it's always a question that's very difficult to answer. Uh, the answer I gave was weeks, not. Weeks or months certainly uh, is what I understand right now, but it's just beginning and we actually don't know. We're going to have to see, uh, you know, how this operation goes. I'm comfortable that strategically we know how to do this. Uh, a, a fully resourced counterinsurgency uh, is the strategy uh, approach, and there are elements of that, and certainly this is a piece of it. And we've got to be able to create the security, not just – not just us alone or with our coalition partners out there, many of whom are represented today by the ambassadors but who are here, but, but also 
in, in rapidly training the Afghan security forces, the police uh, and the Army, to have them assume responsibility for their security as quickly as possible, and then follow that with uh, uh, holding and building from the development side, the diplomatic side, uh, that, that must move forward. Um, moving quickly to Iraq, and, and clearly uh, last, last week was a big week, and the 30th of June was a big day. Uh, as our troops, combat troops, moved out of the cities, that was principally focused on Baghdad and Mosul because we've been moving out of the cities over the last eight months. Uh, and, and we are now positioned uh, outside the cities in support of the Iraqi security forces. Uh, and while there have, been, uh, there have been some incidents and recently some high-profile attacks, uh, the month of June, the overall levels of violence, number of incidents was the lowest since the war started. So uh, at least over the last few days, it's gone well. Clearly, we know it's a vulnerable time. It's a time of transition. Any time of transition is always – there's always vulnerabilities, but right now uh, it looks uh, it, it's proceeding as General Odierno had said he hoped it would once we got the troops out of the city. An awful lot to do in Iraq between now uh, and the end of 2011. Major elections at the beginning of next year, clearly a focus, security for those, making sure we get those right. Our overall force levels will be about where they are through the end of the year, and then after those elections, an expectation next spring that they come down fairly dramatically from the 120 to 130,000 that are there to the 35 to 50,000 uh, that uh, is part was part of the uh, announcement by President Obama when he talked about his Iraq strategy uh, to be out of Iraq by the end of 2011 is where we are. Uh, an, a lot of political challenges associated with that to that political leadership has to engage, and, and I'm in actually encouraged by Vice President Biden's visit and that commitment uh, on the part of our government to make sure that we have that focus as well. And I've also seen Ambassador Hill grab the reins very quickly and work those issues very hard as well. Uh, clearly, an, another huge challenge, I think, for all of us I I in that part of the world is Iran. Uh, and I won't speak to the political issues there, but on the security side, uh, political challenges notwithstanding, still very concerned about their development of nuclear weapons, their, their funding uh, and sponsoring uh, terrorism, focusing that support on Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, et cetera, being a destabilizing inf uh, uh, influence in the region as opposed to a stabilizing influence in the region. Uh, and that the, I believe there's a need to certainly reach out uh, and engage and dialogue with them, and that's obviously up to the political leadership. Uh, I am concerned about them having a nuclear weapon, and as if they got to that point, that being incredibly destabilizing, uh, not just because they'd have the weapon. Uh, I deal an awful lot in Pakistan and Afghanistan relationships, and if you just look at those two countries and where they were, at one point in time, and what's happened since they both achieved that capability, I worry about, you know, a, an arms race, a nuclear arms race uh, in the Middle East region as well. And I don't think any of us uh, can, af can, can afford that. That would be potentially very destabilizing as well. So uh, I'm uh, – and, and there's not a lot of space. I don't see a lot of space between where Iran is headed uh, and, uh, and then potentially uh, what might happen with respect to that development. And, and so there is a great deal that certainly depends on the dialogue and the engagement, and I think we need to do that with all options remaining on the table, including certainly military options. Um, one, other, one other area I'd like to comment about is just sort of the whole – and it's an extension of the nuclear weapons issue – it's counter. It's the uh, the, the counter WMD counterterrorism piece, and what I've worried about for some time is terrorists who get their hands uh, on nuclear devices. And, and I know they seek that, uh, and at the at the at the very high end, Al Qaeda still both seeks that capability and sees us uh, as uh, as the enemy. Uh, and uh, our broad term engagement, I think, uh, across the entire Middle East, and this is this is all of us 
to, to create partnerships and dialogue and understanding uh, and work to make sure that both the, from the terrorism standpoint as well as the proliferation standpoint, we do everything we can to, uh, to absolutely uh, minimize that. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. I don't think the Middle East, uh, the broader Middle East, there's, it has, uh, has ever been more important not just to the regional stability, but to global stability. And uh, as, as I said earlier, I just came out, uh, I just came out of uh, Moscow, and, and one, of the, one of the issues that certainly was discussed was the you know, focus in this part of the world as well, and that responsible leadership throughout the world, I think we need to focus on this and make sure that we generate peaceful outcomes and not ones that generate more conflict. Uh, with so many different challenges uh, in that part of the world. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Alterman. I run the Middle East program here, and I'll be trying to, to be traffic cop for this session. I would just ask uh, four rules. First, uh, if we could wait for the microphone so we can uh, get the sound so everybody can hear. Second, that as a courtesy to the chairman that you identify yourself so he knows who he's talking to, that you ask only one question and that you ask your question in the form of a question, which is not to make a statement and then say, what do you think of my statement? <laughs> so if we have agreements on all those points, I'd be happy to open the floor. Richard Weitz, the Hudson Institute. Uh, when you were in Moscow, did the issue of the Russia's possible completion of the sale of the SS three, uh, S-300 uh, air defense missiles come up? Because that's been factoring into the decision-making process in Israel and hence here about what, what kind of Iranian threat we might see and what kind of timeline we might have to respond to that. One of the things, I'm, I'm happy to broadly talk about the, the summit and certainly my engagement in it. Um, uh, it is something actually part of the part of the, the documents that were signed was a document that I signed with my counterpart signed with my counterpart General Makarov, uh, and it focuses on the mill to mill cooperation. I had actually been in Moscow with him the week before, uh, based on uh, having a, a counterpart visit. I had actually hosted the, my Russian counterpart uh, over 18 months ago, uh, and one of the areas I've certainly discussed with him in the past is that issue uh, and recognizing that that, uh, that issue, that is a, a significant, that particular uh, system is a, is a game changer in that part of the world and I focused on that. Uh, and, and that's probably all I'd say about that today without going into great, I, I'm not going to go into any details of, of the summit uh, as it hasn't, you know, hasn't really even ended yet. Uh, but that's a huge concern because of the potential that it has, and I've raised that certainly with my counterpart. Molly Williamson, Middle East Institute. Uh, do you anticipate greater cooperation between Washington and Moscow vis-a-vis -vis Iran? And if so, what would that look like? Uh, again, I wouldn't. I, I can't. I wouldn't go into any details. Certainly, it was it was discussed, and I'll leave it up to you know the president and the administration to to lay that out. Uh, certainly, going in, there was uh, there were uh, uh, concerns about trying to get that right with respect to the Middle East and specifically how Iran fit into all that. Uh, and uh, and I know there were discussions about that. And the honest truth is, I just don't have the details on those discussions. Hi, uh, Yochid Reason from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Admiral, I was struck a moment ago by how explicitly you said that in the case of Iran, all options are on the table, which is what you often say, but then you explicitly again said that military options specifically. How close do you think we are to the point beyond which an Iranian nuclear bomb becomes inevitable? How much time is there left to deter that from happening? Um, and how close do you think we are really to a point of no return? 
Well, I wouldn't overread the fact that I said including military options, because when I've said all options on the table, I certainly have been inclusive of those. Uh, and it certainly this isn't the first time I've said that to include the explicit statement. Um, where we're challenged here is, is the time frame, uh, which, depending on who you talk to, you know, the estimates of when they, uh, when they would de uh, develop a nuclear weapon. And, uh, again, based on both your assumptions and who you talk to, it's been one to three years. It's sort of in that kind of time frame. Uh, my concern is, is that, you know, the clock has continued to tick. Uh, I believe Iran is very focused on developing this capability. Uh, and I think when they get it, you know, or should they get it, it will be very destabilizing. Uh, I oftentimes, I get, you know, the, another question is the whole strike option piece of that. I also think that would be very destabilizing because of the, uh, in, in, actually in both cases, Certainly a strike or them getting the weapon, all, those are hugely significant in and of themselves. But there's also, with both of those kinds of uh, possibilities, there are unintended consequences that are very difficult to predict in, an, in a very volatile, a highly volatile part of the world, and I worry as much about that as well. So that's why I talk about this very narrow space that we have to, uh, to, uh, to, to work towards an objective of not achieving that capability. Um, and I think the time, you know, the time window is closing without being, you know, exact on, on what it is. Uh, as I indicated, the clock's ticking, and, and that's why I'm as concerned as I am. Mr. Chairman, you started by talking about cooperation. Could you talk specifically about the, the Iranian issue in terms of the cooperation, especially on the military side rather than on the, the diplomatic side? In terms with in terms of cooperation, military co cooperation on military issues, deterring and defending against Iran. Um, cooperation with, with anybody with or states. <laughs> uh, certainly we share uh, we share the concerns. I'm in touch with uh, my counterparts who are in in lots of countries who share the concerns uh, with respect to that. Um, we've worked with our Gulf partners to look at the development of regional uh, defense capability, uh, and I see that as uh, they're very committed to that and expanding that capability over time. Um, we think that's an important, important both initiative and, and recently the steps that have been taken with regard to that uh, I think have been positive. Um, so I, so, so the, I mean, there's. There's cooperation and exchange, both bilateral and multilateral, on this issue uh, all the time. Uh, yet, uh, again, I am concerned about, you know, the clock's moving. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, I'm Chris Eich from CBS. Uh, there have been a lot of questions over the years about both the will and the capacity of the Pakistani military of taking on the Taliban internally. Could you comment on their performance in the recent operation in Swat Valley and <coughs> whether you think they have the capacity of going further into north and south of the region? I'm, I'm very encouraged by what I see based on, the, you know, their recent operations in Swat Valley and actually before that, Mamand and Bonir and uh, Bajur um, and if you and I were having a conversation a year ago about this, there was a great deal of criticism about the Pakistani military not moving at all in the West. Uh, and they've moved a lot. Um, the, the, I know the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Kiani, is committed to this. There's been, in, in my view, an, uh, a, an understand, there is a, he understands, and I think the leadership in Pakistan understands, they have a very serious threat internal to their country, and they're addressing that. Um, and so they've and, – and when I was last there a couple months ago, they – he took me out to uh, two training areas where he is developing counterinsurgency training. I mean, I watched two of his companies go through this, and he's got it now throughout his force. He's, he's got rotation plans. Um, and, uh, and again, it's, it's a very deliberate plan. He's, uh, he's pushed in terms of his overall military uh, capacity as well. He's got two fronts. Uh, we can argue about whether or not 
India is a, a threat to them or not, I can assure you that, that the, the Pakistani people and the Pakistani leadership think India is a threat, and that's his responsibility to address that. So he's got that front at the, on the east, and he's also moving forces to the west. So they've gotten a lot better. They've learned lessons just as we learn lessons in Iraq about how to do this. They're getting better at it. They need support. They need they need enabling capabilities, not unlike what you know, not unlike what we learned, whether it's helicopters or night vision capability, those kinds of things. So they're moving in the right direction, and they're moving in a measured pace. Uh, and this time, I think that what's different this time in SWAT as opposed to last time in SWAT is is the commitment to hold, not just to clear out the insurgents, and that's where he is right now. Uh, uh, and, and as I said earlier, sometimes this doesn't happen at a pace that we'd like, but it's their country and they get to pick that pace. Holding it back against the wall, please. Uh, great. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm wondering if you can give us an update on AFRICOM. I know for a while that DOD was looking to base it somewhere in North Africa in the Middle East and looking for a permanent home. Do you have an update on that? I think it was uh, a few months ago that, that uh, Secretary of Defense made the decision that it would continue to be based in Stuttgart for the next, I, th I think it's through the next three years, I think 9, 10, and 11. And, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, it's worked, it's off to a great start. It really is a command, uh, I think incredibly well led by uh, General Kip Ward, who has rich experience both in Europe uh, as well as uh, in Africa. Uh, it's a full-time commitment now to a continent that, in my view, needed that in terms of both engagement uh, and, uh, and support for countries whose militaries have challenges in, in ways that we engage, quite frankly, in other uh, combatant commands around the world. Um, they, they certainly are, there are big challenges there that, that uh, General Ward is addressing, uh, uh, but both from a staffing standpoint, I think it's important to mention that this staff is a different kind of staff because senior State Department representation is there. Uh, his deputy is a former ambassador, one of the two deputies that he has, uh, and uh, more than any other command, uh, the focus on the broad capabilities of our government, leaders from the from the different agencies of our government are embedded in this staff, uh, and and in a with, with an overall objective of being preventative long term as opposed to having to deal with conflict. So I'm actually encouraged, not just by where it is, but by what General Ward and his uh, and Ambassador Yates and others are doing uh, in Africa. In that corner over there. I am Doug Brooks. I'm with IPOA. Uh, we represent the, the contractors supporting the mission in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Northern Africa. Uh, my question is actually on the Afghan uh, military and police and security sector side. Uh, how is the training and professionalization going there? At what point do we expect that they will actually be taking the lead on a lot of these uh, uh, counter uh, uh, Taliban missions and so on? Where, what's the status? Could you give us a little more of an update? Um, no, actually, not unlike Iraq, we're far ahead in the on the Army side uh, with respect to that as opposed to the training for the police. We've under-resourced the training piece in the past. We're going to send an entire brigade. The 4th and the 82nd is going over later this year to arrive uh, um, towards the end of the summer, focused specifically on training uh, of the Afghan police uh, because we know we're behind. We know how critical that is. Probably no more critical element to holding than the police being able to do that and provide security once the insurgents are cleared out. So we recognize that as a priority, uh, but that's uh, we're and we are both concerned about and focused on the quality. Uh, many of the same kinds of issues that we had uh, in Iraq with respect to that. One of the things that strike me: these are two different countries, and I want to be very careful about drawing direct comparisons between uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. But. There was a time, and it wasn't very long ago, 18 months ago or so, maybe a little longer ago, that our biggest concern in Iraq 
were the police. Uh, very much the same kind of thing I hear now with respect to Afghanistan. Uh, and yet we were able to both provide the trainers, build the capacity where, the, and, and this was also tied to, to improved leadership in the Minister of Interior. Uh, and Minister Atmar, whom I know uh, all of us think is a very strong leader and is very committed to this. So it's that combination of institution building in the Minister of Interior as well as the development of the police that, that is so critical to getting this right for the future. So I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while to do that, but we have it as a priority to move it as rapidly as we can. Honor to Borgraf, CSIS Admiral. You've spoken several times about the untoward consequences that would flow from military action against Iran, either by Israel or the United States. I wonder if you could give us some examples of these serious untoward consequences. Well, if you, uh, and, and I don't want to get into too many hypotheticals, d despite the attractiveness of, <laughs> of that. <laughs> But you worry about, I worry a great deal about the response of, uh, of a country that gets struck and, and the vulnerabilities that regional countries have who are great friends of ours, their populations. Um, and, and, then, and then what's next? Um, and then how does it end up? I, it, uh, it's, and and, and does, it, does it in fact get contained or does it, does it expand? Um, I mean, it's that kind of scenario that is one, for example, and certainly uh, responses potentially in other parts of the world. I, um, we're, what, one of the things that, at least in my experience over the last two decades, is we're not very good at predicting. We're not very good at predicting what's going to happen. We're not very good at predicting where it's going to happen. And in, you know, in more, and I don't just mean we, I mean lots of, lots of countries in the world. And, but I mean, I can focus on us. And then, you know, what are we prepared for, given that unpredictability? So it is, it is a really, from my perspective, it is a really important place to not go if we can not go there in any way, shape, or form. Terry, right here. Uh, Jerry Seib with the Wall Street Journal. Um, Admiral Mullen, you know better than we do there's been a lot of discussion in the last couple of weeks about whether there is or is not some kind of a ceiling on troop levels, American troop levels in Afghanistan. So the question is, is there or is there not a ceiling on troop levels in Afghanistan? Yes, sir. And, and if there is not, when do you think you will know what the level near term to mid term is going to be? There is not a ceiling on troop levels in Afghanistan. Um, the General McChrystal has gone over there, and part of his guidance and tasking is to zero base the troop levels and tell us what you need. And he is. It's a 60-day assessment, so he comes back uh, sometime within that 60-day period to make his recommendations. He's doing that as we speak. I actually have not spoken to him, so I can't tell you how it's going, uh, because I really am anxious to give him time and space to figure this out. Um, he has all the troops that his predecessor has asked for, that you know, President Obama has committed through 2009. In the interim, he will come back with this assessment. And, uh, and my guidance to him is, you tell me what you need, bring it back to Washington, and we'll take it from there. Um, I also want him, uh, very specifically, and actually it's the same discussion I've had with General Odierno, is you need to make sure that every single American soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or coast guardman that is there in your theater is someone that you need. Uh, we we can we do very well at you know moving forces in. We do that, uh, and sometimes we're challenged at moving forces out in terms of the specifics, other than on normal rotation. Uh, 
So you don't need to wait to a rotation date if someone doesn't need to be there. So, so that's General McChrist. That's the totality of his tasking. And then we'll see what capabilities he needs and how many forces he needs to do that. And that's really where we are. The lady right here in the pink, and then after her, Ron Newman. <laughs> Martha Raddatz from ABC, the lady in pink. Um, I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> Admiral Mullen, I, I, mean, I want to follow up on, on Chris's question um, about Pakistan. Are you really confident that the Pakistani military can hold those areas they've gone into? I mean, this is an army that went in uh, with no thought for the internally displaced people. There are about three million of them now. So if you'll answer that and also whether they should go into Waziristan given the population of internally displaced people. But, uh, but first on the whole issue. Let me talk about whether they should go in first. Uh, that's really their decision. Um, and uh, clearly there is a, a growing threat to Pakistan headed up by uh, Batula Massoud that Pakistan is very focused on. So that's theirs to decide. That's where the threat is. Uh, and I don't see that threat going away until they, until they get at that, first of all. Uh, all of us have uh, share a concern about the IDPs, the internally displaced people. There have been significant predictions about how disastrous this IDP creation based on operations would be. And from what I've seen, uh, the, the results have not met those sort of dire predictions that were out there. That doesn't mean that the IDP challenge isn't significant. I know that General Kiani in particular recognizes this. They've, uh, there's a general by the name of Nadim who led their relief effort in the, in the earthquake uh, in 2005 and who was assigned immediately uh, before this operation to address this IDP issue. Uh, and they've been very committed to that. Do they have all the resources? No. There's international commitment to this. The United States has actually um, uh, provided several hundred million dollars to support this. And uh, we're all concerned because monsoon season is coming up, and they've got to start moving here uh, pretty quickly. That said, it has not, uh, in, in the public discussion, uh, in the internal deliberations that I've seen and, and uh, participated in, it has not been as bad as everybody predicted it would be. So, so that that piece is certainly one we're very we continue to be very concerned about, and it is a challenge, uh, um, and I think recognize so. Um, and then the last thing is hold. He has committed to holding. He has put forces in place to hold. When the SWAT operation started, within the first week or two, I got routinely asked, "Is well, what do you think?" The question is, could he sustain the SWAT operation? And he has started to do that. The same question now is there for a hold. He's committed to holding. He's put forces in place to do that. So we'll see. But one of the things in my interaction with him over the last year and a half is he's done what he said he was going to do. Um, and, and he has committed to that and executed to that. And that's why I'm, I'm uh, more optimistic than I am pessimistic. But I don't underestimate the, the significance of the challenge. It's a big one. Ron Newman, former ambassador Hi, Mr. to Afghanistan. Uh, you, you spoke very correctly, I think, uh, out of one statement, about the need of protecting the population and where we're going in training. But would you speak to whether, well, that may be too hard if the policy decision isn't there. My perception is you can't get where you want to go with the size of Afghan security forces, which are now on the drawing board and existing, which is only about one-third of what existed already in Iraq when we began the surge. How do we get to the point you correctly defined of turning over security to Afghan forces? Part of what uh, General McChrystal and actual, uh, is, is doing is uh, actually in its General Formica, who is the training general that's there. Uh, is doing is a detailed analysis on what it takes in terms of the overall security forces for Afghanistan. That's a combination of police, 
as well as Army. And that analysis is ongoing uh, as we speak. Uh, right now, we're in the mid-80s, 1,000 for the Army with the Afghan uh, Army, and, and that uh, is to, to go to a level of 134,000 that's authorized right now. Uh, and we recognize that, that 134,000 may not be right, and it may go up significantly. Uh, and the same for the police, where there are some 82,000 police that are authorized and actually that are in place. The police, the, the challenge isn't the number. The challenge is the quality and the training and getting them out there uh, throughout Afghanistan. Um, but that may grow as well. Uh, your question is a good question, is how do you, you – you have to have a force sized well enough to do that. Uh, in Iraq, it's well over 600,000 uh, by the time all is said and done. So it's that combination of what's the, what's the overall goal, but there's also the reality of we can only build them up so quickly. Uh, and we're doing that right now, and General Formica is very committed, not just him, but certainly as a leader is doing that. And we're trying to take a lot of the things that we learned in Iraq with respect to this in terms of how to do it, take those lessons that took us some time there, compress them, accelerate it, given the opportunity that we have with respect to that, which I think we do right now. In the back? Uh, Hisham Melham, Al Arabiya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, you, uh, uh, the Iranians keep saying that an Israeli attack on their nuclear facilities would be seen as an American attack. And I'm sure they would interpret the statement by uh, Vice President uh, Biden as some sort of a green light to the Israelis. Talk a little bit about what you hear from your Arab friends and from the Israelis about the nature of the Iranian retaliation. You spoke about the difficulty of anticipating that kind of reaction and the vulnerabilities of, of, of your friendly states in the region. And that probably include the American forces in Iraq, include the American, I mean, the oil fields in Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait and UAE. And uh, also a concern that uh, another front will be activated, the, the Lebanese-Israeli front. I mean, what do you hear from your allies and what are your concerns also, but specifically about these areas, oil fields and the Lebanese-Israeli front? Um, I spent a lot of time in direct engagement and time with my Israeli counterpart, General Ashkenazi. And uh, over the last year, year and a half, uh, and, and the, I, this I don't think is news to anybody, but you know, fundamental to this is the Israelis see that Iran achieving a nuclear weapon capability as an existential threat. And that fact is tied to the rhetoric of the leadership of Iran, which says, you know, has said that they would seek to eliminate Israel. And so I think what's very important, at least certainly from my perspective, is to understand the word existential and that uh, obviously Israeli gets to speak for itself, act for itself. It's a sovereign country. Uh, but that's a very real part of, I think, this entire discussion. And I think actually most, from my perspective, my counterparts, my engagements in the Middle East, uh, in, including uh, most of the Gulf area, at least under, understand that uh, they may or may not agree, but they understand that that's clearly where Israel is. And, and, um, uh, and so that, that to me is a very real part of all of what we're dealing with here, and that gets back to the criticality in my view, of solving this before Iran gets a nuclear capability, uh, uh, or that anyone I know would you know take action to to uh, to strike them, and and that I think that window is a very narrow window. Uh, so I'm actually encouraged by our political leadership committed to the dialogue, uh, st even after the challenges that obviously arose in the election. Uh, cycle in Iran, uh, and and so I think, you know, that commitment and and I'm hopeful that that dialogue is productive. I worry about it a great deal if it's not. Last question right here. Uh, Jim Klashevsky with NBC News, Admiral. To follow up uh, on both the questions from Martha and the ambassador. How, how confident are you that the U.S. forces, the Marines in particular, who 
launched this new operation in southern Afghanistan for the first time in those kind of numbers, will in fact be able to clear, hold, and build. And given the somewhat uncertainty you had in your answer to the ambassador about how soon Afghan forces would be ready, just, just how long are U.S. Marines going to have to be entrenched there in the south? And one more part of that question, what yes. in the U.S. strategy in Afghanistan will have to be sacrificed to pursue the clear, hold, and build strategy in Afghanistan? Is that one question? or? Well, I, I followed up on there, too, and then, then my one. Okay. <laughs> like me to disallow it. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I think, Jim, that we have, that the analysis that underpinned the force levels for Afghanistan in the south, which is where the Marines are, was about right. So we've got the forces there. We believe we need to both clear as well as hold. I mean, the, and the Marines are starting to do that as we speak. Uh, again, I have confidence in that based on the analysis that occurred before we sent the Marines in and before any of us asked for additional forces. Uh, and that all fits into what I have confidence in the overall strategy. That I think, you know, that we know how to do this. Um, so I think, so in addition to getting the numbers right, I think that was one part of your question. The other one, you know, do the Marines have enough to hold? Yes, they do. Uh, and then, and then the last part is is how this impacts on the totality of the Afghan Pakistan. <laughs> Pick one. No. I don't think, at least from what I've seen, I don't think the overall strategy suffers. I think because, of, in fact, the overall strategy is, is enhanced by this. Uh, and then I, I get asked questions, questions on time all the time. I think in Afghanistan, uh, the time frame that I speak to is we have to – the trends have been negative for the last three-plus years uh, in terms of levels of violence, the comprehensiveness of the insurgency, uh, the, the, the enemy is getting better and tougher, and we need to turn that around uh, in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, start to turn that around so the trends go in the other direction so that we can provide an opportunity, uh, uh, the, uh, not just the security, but, but sustain it over time. Uh, and I think over the next couple of years, that's, what, that's, the, that's the time frame that I worry about the most. Uh, the additional 4,000 trainers that will show up later this year will dramatically impact the the ramp up for the Afghan police. Uh, how quickly, exactly, hard to say sort of until we get there, until they get there. Uh, but we need to develop that capability on the police and the Army side as rapidly as possible. And that's tied to some possibility, as asked earlier by Ambassador Newman, you know, that that number, that overall requirement may go up here um, in the near future. It may not, but it may. Uh, so all those things are part of where we're focused right now. Mr. Chairman, um, I want to thank you for, for joining us today, for answering the questions with such energy and, and directness. Uh, when I think about your schedule the last several days, doing all the Sunday talk shows, and then being in Moscow yesterday and here today, um, I guess you're a young man, so you can do that, but it makes me tired to just think about it. I think we're especially grateful to you. We're grateful to uh, Ambassador Oteba and his staff. Thank you for coming. <laughs> That's